Good morning. I'm glad that you're with me again as we continue our study on humanity from the image of God to the likeness of Adam and what exactly that means for individuals and for societies. We are going to ask that that question this morning. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? It is a very interesting topic. I've, I've just really had a lot of fun exploring it here the last couple of weeks, and I feel like I've just kind of gotten the, the tip of the iceberg, but we're going we're gonna to jump into that. And in fact, uh, I'm, let, me, let me pray. Actually, let me give you the illustration I was thinking of, and then we'll pray. When I was a little boy, I uh, frequently we would go camping as a family on weekends, and I, I remember sitting by the lake fishing with my dad, and as I would get bored, as little boys are wont to do from sitting there, I would start picking up stones, and I would try to skip the stone across that lake and to see how many times I could get it to bounce before it would finally plunge into the depths of the lake. And I have to tell you, as I take on this subject matter today, I feel like I'm skipping stones across the top of the lake, and, and it's going to plunge into that lake, into the depths, that never to be seen again. And so uh, I hope that as we gather together and as we do this, that really I whet your appetite for, for you to start thinking about this and processing it and to, to explore it on your own. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that we can dive into your word, Lord. And while we may not have satisfactory answers, Lord, we, we know that uh, you are the one that holds all the answers. And, and Lord, that you have given us what we need for, for life and godliness. And, and Lord, that has to, to be enough sometimes. It has to sustain us. And yet, Lord, it uh, also should challenge us to, to grow closer to you, Lord, by seeking uh, the depths of your word. Lord, I just pray this in the name of Christ our King. Amen. So, what is the image of God? In fact, I've got to get, get ready here because we're, we're going to tackle this one. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Two verses that for centuries has led to such differing opinions. And so even as we go through this and I share some of my views, uh, I, I need you to understand and I want you to understand that there is lots of room for disagreement and that even with what we settle upon, we, we need to hold it lightly. Because in, in the brilliance of the scholars that came before us, if they have not been able to come up with definitions, if they've not been able to come up with solid theology that leads to definitive answers, then we need, we need to respect that and, and to make sure that, that we're not dogmatic. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that we can't approach this and, and have reasonable certainty as to what the, the topic is. And so, what well, even as I say that, uh, take a moment, to write on your piece of paper. Uh, I have class notes uh, uh, for, for those that have asked for them. If you're interested in them and haven't gotten them, Pastor Charles at redlandschurch.net, and I'd be glad to email them to you. But... Um, Right on the back of the paper, if you've printed it out, what does it mean to be in the image of God? What, what, is, it, what is it that makes humanity distinct from all the rest of creation? Something for you to, to pause and, and to think about. Uh, I, and instead of asking questions like I normally do, I have printed out my notes 
And so you're going to be able to, to really just follow along. <laughs> and, and I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but I'm going to read a lot of this. And so as I'm reading it, you can follow along with the reading. Uh, these two verses, they've created many different interpretation as God followers have tried to understand what it means to be created in the image and the likeness of God. I'm going to present four views that have enjoyed a relatively large following or appreciation over the years. And, and the thing to understand that these are overviews more than they are views. And, and that, that within each of these overviews, there are many what I'm calling subviews. I've made up my own word. Subviews where there are distinctions that, that various scholars and commentators are going to have and so if they were to, to read my overview they would immediately start finding fault with it even though they might hold to some view that would fit within that overview now if i have not thoroughly confused you yet let's just keep on going you know in, in fact the, the last sentence even the commentators they they don't agree on what to even call these four predominant overviews and, and, and so these, what I, these are my, my, really my own from, from the readings that I've done. I've taken words or phrases from, from various commentators and, and, and so to arrive at these, these four views. Uh, the, the first one I'm calling the, the faculty or immaterial view. It starts out with the thought that God is spirit. And so, because God is spirit, therefore the, the image of God in humanity has to in some way involve our spirit, our souls, even more than it does the, the physical beings that, that we are. And so, uh, um, it would be those, those characteristics that we would call the, the mind and the emotion, the will. Uh, I would throw speech, even though speech is produced by, by a physical characteristic, I, I, I would put speech in there, the ability to, to interact with one another, to, to speak, have someone hear it, process it through their minds, and, and then to, to be able to relate to that thought. Personality would, would fit within that. Uh, we, we have uh, these characteristics leading to self-awareness, creativity, our aesthetic sensibilities. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify or set apart you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's that idea that even our, our trifold nature, according to this, the, the soul and the spirit and the body, they're, they're a reflection of the, the three-part nature of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. And, and, and so some commentators would, would equate each part of that body with each part of the Godhead. Uh, another thought would be, e even when we die, that body, it returns to the ground while our, our spirit is present with Jesus. Uh, Ecclesiastes, we're going to look at 12.7. This is going to be a Bible drill today, and so... Uh, you're going to have to, to put up with me as I try to think of where Ecclesiastes is. I've already passed it twice each direction and still not any closer. Ecclesiastes, the very end of it, chapter 12. Verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And, and so again, we, we have that idea that, that our bodies that God made from the dust of the earth, they're gonna, it's going to return back to the, the earth. But our spirit, which God gave, is going to return to him. And, and so it's the idea that that image, that likeness of God is our spirits. 
And those spirits, everything that makes up who we are, is, it's returning to, to God. Uh, to, to be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. Uh, I believe it's Corinthians that says that. Turn back just a couple of pages or maybe a page to Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Behold, I have found only this, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many devices. And if you were to back up and to read this, you would discover that the thought of the writer of Ecclesiastes here is that, that man chases after many different things. But, but God made us upright, he made us righteous from the beginning. And so that idea that we have these characteristics of God... And in righteousness would be one of them. So that's that's one view. The the second view is the idea of form or material. That that while God is spirit, he yet relates to those in scripture as having some sort of form. This form or glory is what is meant when God created humanity in his image and likeness. The, the idea here is that, that God, we say anthropomorphically, relates to us. That, that while God is spirit, he speaks of having a hand. He holds the universe in the palm of his hand. That he has eyes and ears with which he sees and he hears. That, that God relates anthropomorphically to us and so maybe it's even more than anthropomorphically that God in some way has a form the the other thought in this and I've kind of lumped these views together though they're not necessarily together is that that God's glory is what is meant here and that that, that God is he is glory and his glory is at times evident gives that glory to humanity and that because of our sin that that glory is in some way veiled until we are set right with Jesus I know I've not explained that well but but bear with me as as we read through these verses it's it's going to help to to explain that, and, and I'm going to emphasize that a little bit more. Um, Exodus 33. We, we looked at this verse last week, and, and, and yet it's, it's a really good verse to return to because, it, it again, it's going to capture the, the heart uh, of this view. Exodus 33, 18. Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But the Lord said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about that while my glory is passing by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not or shall not be seen. And we see here that if we take this literally, that, that Moses as he writes this is saying that he's equating some form of the Lord to his glory. And that the Lord himself is saying, you can't see my face or you will die. Therefore, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to take my hand and cover you so that you won't see my face. But after my glory has passed by, I'll remove my hand and you'll be able to see my backside. And, and so the idea is that even... And then the... the Scholars will, will take this thought and say that as Moses spent time before the Lord, the 40 days up in the Lord's presence, he came down from the Lord's presence and his face reflected the glory of God. 
and that he veiled himself as that, that glory faded away. And that ultimately, as we are restored to our rightful image in the age to come, that, that we too will reflect that glory. That glory will be present in us. And, and that's what it means to be made in the image of God, is to have that, that bodily form, that material form, as well as the, the, glo the glory or the ability to reflect that glory. Psalm 94.4, again, gives us that same thought as to a material form of some sort with the Lord. Psalm 94.4 says that this, um, this is not the verse that I wanted. Okay, Sometimes you write down the verses and it doesn't turn out to be the one that you want it to be. So, if you have notes, just scratch out Psalm 94.4 because it's not saying what it, I thought it said. So I'm going to have to go back and figure out what it was in the Psalms. Let's move on. We're going to skip Genesis 5. Tim's going to be here next week. And, and he has developed his own thoughts here that are, are going to talk about how Adam was created in the likeness of God, the image of God. And yet Seth, as we see in Genesis 5, is in the likeness of Adam. And what is exactly that mean? So I'm going to, I'm going to let him handle that next week. I'm going to move on to Ezekiel. No, no, let's, let's do Psalm 104, because we're right there. Let's do Psalm 104, one, uh, 104, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with splendor and majesty, covering thyself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. And then it continues on with the creative acts of the Lord. But the idea here is that the Lord is he's clothed with splendor and majesty, covering thyself with light as with a cloak, that it's, it's talking about the glory of the Lord. And then let's, let's move on. Again, another reference here in Ezekiel to, to the form of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Now, above the expanse that was over their heads, and this is, this is Ezekiel's vision, and he's seeing a vision of heaven. And he says, uh, now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazul in appearance, and on that which resembled a throne high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. That word appearance there is the same word as likeness that we have in Genesis 1.26. So when God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, that appearance here in Ezekiel 1.26 is that same word. And so we have the appearance of a man. Verse 27, Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like a glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire and there was radiance around him as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the appearance of of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. And, and so this radiance, this glory is appearing on the one who's in the appearance, the likeness of a man sitting on the throne. Well, we have uh, Daniel talking about the ancient of days sitting on the throne when the Son of Man comes. To him. And, and so again, some kind of material form to the Lord. And obviously, as humans, we have a material form. Finally, let's look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 40 through 43. Matthew 13. 40-43. 
Um, this is, Jesus is telling the, the parable of the, the tares, where the weeds are uh, uh, planted in with the wheat. And, and as he concludes, he says in verse 40, Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And so Jesus is saying that the righteous in this coming age, they're going to shine forth in their righteousness as the sun does. And so it seems to indicate that the humanity, those that are righteous, are going to have their own glory, even as God has his glory. All right. The next view is the function or the royal representative view. And the idea of this is taken in from verse 26 of Genesis 1 where God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. And, and, and so God's image in, in us is that image of authority, that, that even as God created the sun to rule over the day and the moon to rule over the night, he created humanity in his image to rule over the earth. Um, contextually, Moses is, is writing to his audience as they're coming out of slavery in Egypt, where Pharaoh is held to be descended from the gods and that he is their image bearer. And, and so to look at, at Pharaoh is literally as Pharaoh performs his functions, is to look at the gods. And so Moses may be saying here in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that, that we are the image bearers of God, all of us, because all of us have been given that authority, that command, that, that right to rule over all of the earth. And so it's not just limited to the Pharaoh, but rather, contextually speaking, it's all of humanity that is an image bearer of the God. Uh, Psalm 8 would be uh, a, a good one to, 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 for, for this. In Psalm 8, we, we have David questioning, What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that, that even, you even have thoughts of him? And then it goes on to say that you've made him a little bit lower than the angels, but you've given him this authority to rule and to reign over the earth. The fourth view, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it, it, it's a fairly apparent view as, as far as understanding it. The, the last view that, that I want to bring up is a relatively recent view. Uh, Karl Barth, the Swiss theologian, is the driving force really behind this view in the mid-20th century. And it's a community or a relational view. And, and they're emphasizing when God says, let us make man. And, and the idea here is that us being either a, a tri the Trinity... God the Father, God the Son, and God the, the, the Spirit communing with one another, interacting with one another, saying, let us do this. Or it's the idea of God before a, a pantheon of, of angels saying, here's what we're going to do. Let us. And then uh, in verse 27, the emphasis again is that God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. That emphasis on God creating the male and female together. First in a singular and then in the plural. And so the idea of a community view, a relational view, that we were 
created to be in relation with God and in relation together, men and women together. Um, and of course, I didn't write down any, any verses for this because I have no idea why I didn't write any verses down. But again, as, as you think about this, this relational view, obviously it makes a lot of sense that we were created to be in relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with one another. The very first thing that, that we see at the end of, of Genesis chapter 2 is that for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father, cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And, and, and so we have that idea of relation. The, the question is, is that are we putting the cart before the horse? That because we were created in the image of God, we can't help but function in, in that community view, in that relational view. As I look at the overview of all of these, these views here, these four views, and all the, the sub-views that go with them, I, I can't help but ask the question that my seminary professor, um, Robert Pine, Bob Pine, asked, is there not truth in all of these views? Do we not really get a glimpse into the, what it means to be an image-bearer of God in examining all of these views and, and saying yes? That, that there are parts and pieces of all of these views that are true. Uh, here's how he defines the, the image of God. The image of God consists of humanity's investment with God-like glory and moral capacity to reflect his character while ruling the earth as his representatives. See, did he not really take pieces of all of these views? Um, the image of God consists of humanity's investment with godlike glory and moral capacity to reflect his character while ruling as his representatives. Turn with me to Colossians 3. There's a great passage, Romans 8, 15 through 30, that I am not going to read to you. But take some time and, and, and really spend some time reading through that. Again, Romans 8, 15 through 30. Wonderful section that, that, that gets us to, to think on, on that very characteristic, on that, that very idea that, that God created us with an immaterial part of him, with the material, with the royal representative, and, and to be in relation with him. Go, go, but back to Colossians 3, uh, verses 9 through 11. It says, uh, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. And, and so the idea here is that in Christ, that, that we are becoming a new creation. We, we've put off the old self, that is the, the image and the likeness of Adam. And we've put on a new self. God working in us to manifest his image. Um, it, it, it's according to knowledge. It's according to the faculties that, that God has given us. That they're being purified. That they're being renewed into the image of God. Uh, and it's a renewal in which there's no distinction. That there's the equality between the Greek and the Jew, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the barbarian and the Scythian, the slave and the free man. We could go to Galatians and add men and women, but Christ is all and in all. And, and we see that, that then we, we function as Christ intended us to function. That we are in relationship as Christ intended us to be in relationship. That we 
uh, are, are using the, the form that God has given us for the purposes that God intended it to be used for. As we use that, that will and the emotion and the personality and the creativity all to honor God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. And um, well, let me read it and, and then, then we'll talk about it. Uh, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you, not know, do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? And so if you remember, the Corinthians had talked to Paul and they're talking about how they're suing one another. And so Paul says, why are you taking this to, to public court when you should be deciding it yourself? God has invested you to function as his representatives here on earth. Do you not know that as his representatives that one day you're going to judge the angels? And if God is going to give you that authority, you ought to be able to decide matters like this on your own. And, and so again, we see that idea that we were God's royal representatives here upon earth. And, and one day it's even going to be extended further than that. Um. Another quote that I, I liked from, from one of the, the books that I've been reading, uh, Dignity and Destiny, Humanity and the Image of God. Uh, John Kilner, he argues that God created human, humanity as whole beings, as entity rather than the created image of God being some aspect within humanity, meaning that it's not just the immaterial part of us it's just not the material part of us it's just not the the royal representative view it's not just that that in some way is we're in community that we are the image of God but that God created the whole person of us to reflect the whole image of God uh, I go back to that verse that I started with in first Thessalonians 5 that God, let, let God set apart, let God sanctify you completely, soul, spirit, and body. And that it's in our soul, spirit, and body that we reflect the likeness of God, the image of God. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to work this backwards because we're right here at 1 Corinthians 11. If you're looking at my notes, I actually started in Genesis. But I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 11.7. Uh, and it says, For man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. And, and so the idea here is that because man in all of him is the image of God, he shouldn't have his head covered. Uh, James 3.9 talks about... Um, James 3.9 says, well, I'm going to back up and say, let's start with A, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Again, James, as he's writing this, is not saying that it's some aspect of a man that with our tongue we curse as the image of God, but rather it's man, it's humanity in general, it's the whole person, it's the whole entity that is being cursed. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to end with uh, Genesis 9-6, and then I want to point out something that's really cool. All right, Genesis 9-6. All right, Moses, or no, Moses, reminds me of the old joke. Uh, how many animals did no, uh, Moses take with him on the ark? Well, none, because Moses wasn't on the ark. However, Noah was. And as Noah has come off the ark and God has made a covenant with him, here's what he says in Genesis 9-6. The Lord speaking, 
Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. All right, again, it's not speaking of a certain part of a man. It's speaking of, of a man as a whole person. And then if that man's blood is shed, then the one that did the shedding of that blood, his life is required of him. And, and so I, I, I'm really, as I, I look at this, I, I'm really liking the thoughts of Dr. Pine, the thoughts of Dr. Kilner, as they talk about man as we are, humanity as we are, being made in the image of God. Rather than trying to define a certain aspect, it's just, it's just emotion, will, and, and intellect. It's just uh, the reflection of God's glory in us. It's just how we function as God's royal representatives here. It's just how we are in community with God and with one another that speak to the image of God. I'm going to say it's all of that, that it's a very complex and beautiful and wonderful thing that, that to be an image bearer of God. I want us to turn to Colossians 1.15, and I want to end with this thought. It, it does have a lot to do with the image of God. Uh, one of my kiddos the other day was asking, how can Christ be half man and half God and, and, and still not sin. And, and I had to tell my son as we were talking about this that no, Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man and while we can't understand it, we accept it as true and, and that he chose not to sin. In Colossians 1.15, it speaks of Christ and it says... He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Whenever Jesus is spoken of, he, and he's being related to as God, it says that Jesus is the image of God. He is the image of the invisible God. It, when it, when humanity is being referred to in that way, there's always a pronoun. God made man in his image. Uh, look back at, at Colossians 3.10. It, it says, uh, and, have, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to, to the image of the one who created him, according to. And, and, and actually that according to is probably the best translation. Even, even if we were to go back to, to Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, let us make man according to our image, according to our likeness. Uh, verse 27, so God created man according to his image, according to. To the image of God he created him. And so whenever Christ is spoken of. It's simply he is the image of God. When humanity is spoken of. It's always according to the image of God. And therefore Christ is always maintaining his place in the Godhead. And I don't want to leave you on that thought. Because ultimately our goal is to be like him. According to him. As God wills and works in our lives to create us, to finish that good work that he's began in all of us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this. Lord, I just pray that as we continue to learn of you and, and that we would be amazed. That we would be amazed by who you are and what you have done, what you are doing, what you promised to do. Lord, I pray that in this time of COVID outbreak, that you would continue to keep us safe, that you would continue to protect us, keep us healthy. Lord, we pray for the vulnerable. Lord, we, we pray, uh, Lord, that, that we who are healthy and, and strong would continue to reach out in, in safe ways to those that might be lonely during this time, that, that Lord, we would function as your representatives as we consider, Lord, how you have given us this place, this time, these bodies, these 
spirits and souls to accomplish your work. We pray this in the name of Christ our King. Amen. I hope that you have a good day and a good week. I will talk with you later.